Hello, everyone. Uh, today we are here to talk about cloning uh, Dolly the sheep. We all know famous Dolly the sheep, uh, but before we actually saw the living, breathing proof of concept, most people didn't even know that it is possible. And a few years later, they copied cats. They actually called her CC or copycat, uh, <laughs> then a horse, and nowadays, uh, if your pet that you really loved just died and you have a spare hundred thousand dollars, you can have it back. So, but how about humans? Why don't we clone the humans? Well, there are several reasons for that. One is commercial, uh, because at least officially there is no commercial interest in doing it. Uh, of course, there are legal and ethical issues. And uh, most of all, there are scientific countermeasures, I mean, <laughs> scientific obstacles. Uh, most scientists would agree that it's very difficult to clone a primate. Uh, but can we be really sure that there is no living human clone walking around us? But how about mobile contactless payments? Well, I think we can safely agree uh, that uh, based solely on the market growth predictions, uh, the fraudsters definitely have commercial reasons to do it. And uh, of course, this, this is illegal and unethical to steal people's money, but I don't think the fraudsters have such kind of morality. So we actually have left the technical countermeasures left, and uh, there are a lot of them. So uh, there is tokenization, there is uh, cloud secure element, device provisioning, fault detection, and so on. But can we be really sure that these countermeasures work as expected and they can withstand the incoming threats? Well, we're about to find out in a few minutes, but uh, first things first, uh, we'll need a short introduction on this technology. So uh, who of you uh, knows what is cost cut emulation? Okay. <laughs> Who pays by the phone, by contactless payments? Okay, maybe someone is implementing it from a bank. Or <laughs> oh, yeah, great. <laughs> but I think a short introduction will not hurt. Uh, we'll get back uh, about 10 years uh, when the first mobile contactless payments were born. The idea was to make them as secure as the plastic cards, to embed a secure element, hardware, uh, which will keep all the card data and all the services which are run uh, in the Atlet Java card inside this hardware secure element, and it con connects directly to the NFC antenna, so the mobile OS and applications do not have access to the card data. But uh, already then, uh, everybody knew that the mobile contactless payments are the future, so everybody wanted to control it. <laughs> and uh, there were very difficult uh, arrangements between <laughs> banks and mobile operators who owned uh, these secure elements on the SIM cards. And, uh, well, actually, uh, it also was very difficult to and painful to, to, to make it work. I, for example, have still such SIM cards there, but I can't use it because uh, it requires a special firmware from my, from my operator. Uh, so. When Google introduced the first Google Wallet in 2011, it was based on the Galaxy Nexus embedded secure element hardware. Uh, the mobile operators already had their own idea how to rule the world. They created ISIS. Yes, it was called ISIS Wallet, actually. <laughs> uh, and uh, they deliberately blocked Google Wallet from their mobile phones because it used the secure element hardware. So uh, Google uh, decided to go in other way uh, without the secure hardware. Of course, the ISIS had to change its name and a few years later was acquired by Google, but uh, the, the spark of the revolution Google initiated couldn't be stopped anymore. It was called the uh, host cut emulation introduced in Android 4.4. There is no more need for this hardware trouble secure element. Everything is moved to the cloud, and the software emulates the card. So everyone is happy. Uh, so how does it work? 
Well, uh, actually, uh, seeing is believing, <laughs> so uh, I will show you uh, a live demo, I hope. <laughs> uh, I will try to pay with it. I have the contactless terminal here, over there. Okay, and I have a phone. Hopefully, when I close the phone, uh, one second. Okay. And the transaction is accepted. Sorry, it's in Polish. I couldn't change uh, the terminal language to English. So I just put the phone close to the payment terminal and I'm blocked. Uh, okay, let's get back to the slides. Uh, Okay, but uh, you know how it works uh, from user perspective, but if you are a bank, how would you integrate it into your, mo your own mobile application? Well, you could do it y by yourself, but it would be very painful and a costly and long time uh, <laughs> uh, certification process. Uh, so there are many external libraries uh, that you can uh, include into your mobile applications uh, both Visa and MasterCard have their own SDKs, uh, but there are several other products that integrate uh, HCE library for you. Uh, and uh, there's no clear market winner. Uh, there are many of them. Uh, so how does this look from the users, uh, from the integrator's perspective? Well, this is a fragment of the real documentation. Uh, it shows that the encryption keys uh, are stored in a secure environment uh, somewhere in the cloud, hidden between two firewalls and reverse proxy. Uh, and another fragment of the documentation uh, for the developer is that you actually need to care only about the SDK API to this, to this uh, external library. <coughs> and this external library is uh, showed like, uh, like a separate entity and it's actually called the same like, like the applet running in the secure el element hardware, and there is secure element in the cloud. So this is the reality that the, the mobile developer is fa uh, faced to. And <laughs> when I talked to the guys, uh, they didn't believe that it's possible to clone this card. While both Visa and MasterCard knew about this possibility, uh, it was somewhere lost in the translation, I think. Uh, so <laughs> that's why I decided to provide a working proof of concept that it is possible. Uh, and <laughs> that's where my research starts. Uh, my name is Sławomir Jasek, or Sławek Jasek, by the way. Uh, I enjoy AppSec for several years now. And the more I moved to the research recently, the more I enjoy it. <laughs> uh, so uh, enough for the introductions, let's cut to the chase. How do we actually steal the money? <laughs> so I'd like you to imagine uh, that you are a group of thieves uh, which are focused on this new lucrative target, the money in the phone. So how do you steal the money? Well. The obvious idea is to steal the phone, right? <laughs> Double jackpot. <laughs> we have the phone and we can pay with it. But think of it. If you would lose your smartphone, think of it. If, if you would lose your smart smartphone, then how many seconds exactly would you know that you are offline? <laughs> well, of course you would immediately report it and cancel all the cards as soon as you will find a way to contact your bank without the phone. But uh, I don't think it's, it's really a risk. Uh, and it's uh, also not uh, very common uh, for the uh, plastic cards. So how about NFC? Well, we know there are uh, mobile applications that can read NFC data from the card, right? So I have such a mobile application here. Uh, NFC card reader, so we'll try to read uh, the data from this card. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, so I have this NFC card reader. I will try to read from this card, but it doesn't work. Well, why does it need to work? Well, the screen has to be on. Okay, now I can read it. So it's not possible <laughs> to do it without the user's content. Con uh, without the user's consent, that's, uh, for example, through his pocket, right? The screen has to be on. And th but uh, even if the screen is on, well, I, I could read the card data. So I have the card data uh, and expiration date. This is actually my real card data. Okay, now <laughs> tell me, <laughs> how many of you have made a picture of it? <laughs> well, <laughs> okay, I would do it. <laughs> this is a hackers conference. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I need to <laughs> tell you uh, that unfortunately, uh, even if you made a picture of it, you won't be able to make online payments with it. I will tell you in a moment why. Uh, you may be able to create a so-called track two of MacTribe. There are mobile applications which to which you can upload this data and they will work as NFC uh, to the NFC compatible uh, uh, terminal which supports uh, MacTribe via NFC. <laughs> so it might be possible, I wasn't able to do it, but if you <laughs> do it, uh, Please don't steal my money. <laughs> Let's do the research together, right? <laughs> so why you can't use this uh, card uh, number for online payment? Well, there is so-called tokenization. So the real card number uh, is uh, changed into a random one. Every time you enroll a new device, you get a new random number. It usually stays uh, for the whole uh, life of this device, but if you enroll another device, you get another random number, and they have limited domain use. I mean, you can't use them for online payment, only for the uh, contactless payment. So uh, we have this card number, but it's not enough to make the uh, contactless payments. Uh, why exactly, how exactly do, 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 do these contactless payments work? Well, be, uh, besides this uh, number of the card, you need a cryptographic key, which is then used to uh, make EMV transactions. Uh, so what we are after is actually this, this key. Uh, so how do we steal this key? Well, one of the ideas would be to steal it in transit when it's uh, transferred to this mobile application, uh, but that's quite uh, difficult. Usually the, usually the architecture is complicated, involves a lot of servers and uh, quite often Google Cloud push. Uh, so <laughs> in most cases I saw there is proper certificate pinning and also very often there's a second layer encryption. So you have uh, Sometimes there is uh, a proprietary protocol. Uh, and uh, of course, there may be vulnerabilities in it. I saw a lot of improper certificate pinning in implementations. I can talk hours what you can do af after decoding the proprietary encryption. Uh, but uh, as long as it is <laughs> very exciting for a pen tester, I s don't think it could be exploited in the wild. Uh, so, um, other ideas how to steal this key? Well, it's stored in user space, so maybe we could somehow get it from the phone. Well, one of the ideas would be to have a uh, malware on this phone. A typical banking malware uh, works as an overlay uh, which steals users' data. Uh, it shows uh, uh, a fake uh, login screen or something can intercept SMSs, but the typical malware, the most common one, uh, doesn't have access to the user's data stored in the application's private folder. So you can't have the access to this key. So uh, how can we access this, this, this key data? <laughs> well, uh, you need a route. <laughs> 
I, I suppose uh, most of you know <laughs> what it means. Uh, root gives you the bare bone access to the file system, all the data you, you need to know. Uh, uh, root is gold. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, how do we get root? Well, there are already frameworks and tools which aggregate many various uh, exploits. The, they are able to abuse Android vulnerabilities to get, to, uh, to get uh, the root credentials. And there are already uh, multiple malware instances uh, that are able to root the phones. Uh, well, uh, and they, they is getting more and more of them. So if we were able to make uh, this uh, root malware into the user's phone, we would be able to get this data. But uh, the data is encrypted. <laughs> well, of course it is encrypted. How could it be? <laughs> So how do we decrypt this key? Well, this is Android, right? So we can take the binary, decompile it, and understand what's going on, right? Uh, not so easy. <laughs> they use really good obfuscation in most cases. Well, of course, there are the obfuscators, and of course, uh, it is possible to reverse everything. But if you were an attacker, you would need to do it for every single application, uh, repeat the steps. And it's really difficult and uh, uh, time consuming. So I noticed that uh, creators of such uh, security mechanisms, they tend to uh, uh, imagine that when attacker sees such uh, safeguards, uh, he will take his uh, simple tool, like machete, <laughs> and he will fight for this. <laughs> but what if there was another way, uh, another way around this security mechanism? So uh, let's, let's actually think how this encryption works. Uh, I will show you once again how the payment is done. Uh, you just take up your phone, press it, and it's done. So you don't need to unlock this phone. Well, s in sometimes you need to unlock, but uh, in most cases, no. And there is also a business requirement that it should work uh, offline. So if your phone is not online, uh, you should be able to make payments, at least a few of them. So how does the encryption can work? <laughs> Well, uh, the encryption key has to be somehow stored on the phone or maybe hard-coded into the mobile application or combined. Uh, there is actually no other way, I think, right? So uh, you probably have an idea how to clone this. So we'll take another device, we will install the same mobile application, and we will copy all the data. So it should work, right? But it doesn't. <laughs> Why? Well, there is another countermeasure. Uh, they uh, call it device provisioning. So the, uh, only the specific device can decrypt this key. So how does this work? Well, uh, probably the encryption key has another element in it. Um, something device specific so what are the so what if we what if we took uh, the same device uh, with uh, the same hardware model and we could even change the IMEI number uh, so and then compute the data what would happen well it turns out that it works <laughs> in most cases uh, and in most cases you need to copy also other users data not just the uh, data of, the, of this mobile application, but I don't think it's really practical <laughs> to attack on a mass scale. So if an attacker had to clone uh, a byte the same device, physical device for every user he wants to attack, the return of investment in this attack won't be, uh, won't be very satisfying, <laughs> right? So uh, we need to find out an idea how to do it uh, on a different device. So, 
let's take a look what exactly device characteristics are possible to, to take from the device. Well, there are several of them, uh, but many of them are not suitable for this use because, for example, OS version can change in time, so your application would stop to work if you re-upgrade. Uh, many characteristics are un very troublesome or impossible to get from the phone because of privacy matters uh, or non-standard implementations. Uh, some of them require special privileges, as for example, uh, this one requires uh, respawn state and when user installs it and sees that the mobile application wants to make phone calls, well, for most banking applications it's not a problem, they already have this privilege, but for many it may be a problem. <laughs> Uh, so, most commonly used are, are Android ID, uh, the, the uh, ID which uh, your device gets uh, upon registration to Google, uh, and uh, some of the SDKs I noticed, uh, they go, uh, they try to use device ID, but uh, they are moving towards using less uh, characteristics for this to be less troublesome for for the uh, for the permissions. So, can we spoof this <laughs> on another device? Well, yes, we can using, for example, uh, Expose framework, uh, which uh, works between uh, the mobile application and the OS. And well, on the standard device, uh, well. When the mobile application asks the OS about an identifier, it gets it straight from the OS, but uh, on the where, where you have Expose Framework installed and you have a, a specific uh, module that can change the, the specific ID, uh, well, it can ask, it, it intercepts this, this call and it can, it can inter ask the OS, but doesn't have to, and returns a different one, the spoofed one. So. In this way, using the Expose framework, we can uh, spoof the original device without having the exact the same hardware. Uh, and uh, in this way, uh, this attack will work. But of course, uh, it all requires root. And uh, of course, uh, these applications have root detection. But uh, Tell me, how many of you have rooted the phone? Yeah, a lot of you. And how many of you had to hide this from various applications? Like Pokemon Go, for <laughs> example, <laughs> or banking applications. So, so we know that a root and the root hiding is some kind of cat and mouse game, right? So if you have uh, ultimate access to the, to the OS, you can always hide from the root, uh, root uh, seekers, right, <laughs> root detection. And most uh, of all, the, the root detection works mostly for the most popular uh, routing methods, and uh, malware could use something non-standard, which is not detectable. So, for example, Android Pay uh, uses Google's own safety net uh, to detect root, uh, and it's quite good, uh, but can be, of course, bypassed. Uh, and this is a decompiled fragment of the safety net root detection, how exactly it searches for the super user binary. So, uh, in order to uh, bypass this, uh, I will use a very complicated and sophisticated attack uh, just a second, I will connect to the device. Uh, okay. Okay, so now I'm connecting to this device. Uh, ADB South. So I will connect via uh, remote ADB, but uh, let's imagine that I have uh, malware with root, right? So instead of using SU, uh, my method is to use, uh, use your initials. So in my case, this is j SJ and I have root now. So, uh, and it's not detected by the safety net. Uh, so I could uh, 
copy uh, the relevant user data, This term, uh, I will just need to and the bucket is made. We will talk about the script in a moment. Okay, so now I can disconnect and uh, get this data. Okay, so yeah. So I have the, the data from this phone, um, and I have another phone. This is the Apache phone, obviously. Uh, and on this phone, uh, I have um, also Android Pay installed. Uh, let me switch to the uh, camera again. Uh, okay. Okay. So there is also Android Pay installed, but when I uh, try to run it, uh, it's not been initiated yet. So uh, when I want to read the card, for example, using a card reader. Uh, it will show you that the it's not yet active, right? So uh, set up Android Pay, uh, I don't have the card data. So now I will connect uh, remotely to this device, the attacker's one. Um, And I will try to restore it. Also use my initials to get root. Uh, and I have another script to restore this. Okay, and this is false. And I will need to rebuild this phone. I do not need it anymore. And we'll try to make a payment with it. Uh, let's try a moment of truth. Let's try again. Uh, it wants me to insert the card, but how do I insert this card? <laughs> uh, it was denied, declined because of other reason. Let's try again. Okay, and the transaction is accepted. So when I check uh, using this card reader, 
um, the card data, uh, I can get exactly the same card number and to confirm that um, this is the clone data. because of the rubber. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I have also the card, uh, can read the card reader from it, and it is uh, exactly the same card. Uh, I have just cloned uh, the card data from one Android phone, from this one, uh, the victim one, to the other one. Uh, so, the demo works, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> uh, and you're probably uh, interested uh, what the cloning script. Uh, well, it's not rocket surgery. Uh, it's based on a simple commands. I use star. Uh, you probably also know change owner. Uh, this one is probably the least known. Uh, this is the one to uh, repair the SI Linux permissions. Uh, and I actually, uh, I promise not to disclose the scripts, uh, but I think you deserve for them. So uh, we'll make a deal that I will show them for a second and we'll cut the dust later. <laughs> so <laughs> if you're ready, uh, here it goes. Uh, you have your chances. <laughs> so uh, another one script to restore this uh, star data. Well, you saw it, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, well, there is one secret ingredient though for Android Pay. Uh, you need exactly the same OS version and exactly the same Google services version uh, for this to work, but it's, it's doable. Right, so this, this proof of concept was done on a single low value transaction and it was actually made from the same uh, network and on the same terminal. Uh, so, uh, I strongly believe that Google has uh, FDS uh, behavioral analysis that do not allow you to just clone all the users' data to other phones uh, without uh, any <laughs> uh, <laughs> actual uh, consequences. <laughs> I mean, without the, they, they uh, knowing it that, it that, for example, two exactly the same phones appear uh, in various regions. Uh, and of course, banks have they also their own fraud detection system. And uh, most of all, uh, they knew that this could happen. So uh, they store only a few keys on the device and they are single use keys uh, or limited use keys. So we can make only a few transactions and these transactions are below the flow limit, so-called. So what could go wrong? Well, then you, can, then you need the keys to replenish. How does this work? <laughs> well, actually, in order to get the keys, the replenished keys, uh, it's mostly also complicated. <laughs> Let's for simplicity say that the key consists of, of two parts. One is uh, from the server, from the banking server, and another one is pushed, usually pushed from the, through the Google Cloud messaging. So. Actually, this part we already have, so we can successfully uh, impersonate the real device to the banking server, and uh, banking server cannot determine, determine who is contacting him. We can uh, also cut off the original user uh, and uh, request a, a, a proper uh, API call to get the, the replenished value. And in many cases, it is enough, just enough. <laughs> you get the new values just by simple uh, uh, JSON uh, REST API request. But in most cases, you also need the Google push. So how do you intercept Google push that was intended to another device? Well, of course, you could, if you have, the if you have full control over this device, you can intercept it on the victim's device. But it would be more interesting to rewrote it somehow. <laughs> so uh, how do we do it? Well, 
we actually already done that <laughs> by cloning Android Pay. I cloned all the users' data on the relevant users' data so that both devices have the same Android ID, the same keys, and so on, and they are visible in Google services as the same device. So I made a test push, uh, and while both devices were online, uh, sometimes both of them received the push, sometimes only my spoofed one, uh, and of course, when I disconnected the original device, I always received this push. So uh, in this way, uh, I am able to make multiple transactions because I can renew these keys. Uh, but <laughs> we are still have limit, limits on the number of transactions. So uh, the transactions are actually the low value ones, right? So let's talk about this floor limit. Uh, so the transactions which are above the specifi specified uh, amount, uh, that depends on the country, uh, they need additional authorization. In most cases, uh, you need to enter the PIN on the terminal. But how do you set up this PIN? Well, it turns out uh, that as a result of a business requirement, uh, in many applications, the uh, hotspot emulation card enrollment needs to go uh, through the, uh, the whole process needs to go through the mobile uh, application. So uh, you get the new card uh, and you set up the PIN in the mobile application. So of course, if I have a remote malware on this uh, device, I could intercept this PIN or I could trick a user, for example, to uh, you need to change this PIN overlay. Uh, <laughs> so I would have al also this PIN. Um, but there is another very interesting feature. It's called CVCVM. So uh, in, in order to understand it, uh, let's see a movie. Um, so I need a voice for that. Okay. Voor bedragen boven de 25 euro moet u op uw smartphone uw ING mobiel betalen viercijferige pincode invoeren. So where do you enter the PIN? Well, on the phone, right? <laughs> but <laughs> how does it work? Um, it's called um, it's called uh, CVCVM, Consumer Device Card Holder Verification Method. So uh, when both uh, the payment terminal and the device support this method of consumer verification, uh, then uh, the terminal says the, the car hold, car, let's start the card holder verification. This happens on the user's device. It may be entering a PIN, it may be some biometrics or various other means. Uh, and uh, the device sends to the terminal that it is verified. So what if we had malware on this device? Well, of course we could intercept also this PIN, uh, but uh, in this way we could make more transactions on higher volume. Uh, but actually not many applications support CVCVM. Well, they are thinking of it, uh, but they say the terminals doesn't do not support it, they are not in very much hurry, and uh, minority of applications support uh, the CVCVM. So what if the application doesn't support CVCVM? Is it, is it fail safe? Can, can we attack it somehow? Well, the application doesn't support CVCVM, but it has a HCE library which supports it. So uh, the library has API names which cannot be obfuscated because this is API SDK. So uh, these are, for example, API names, set CVM verification modes and Boolean value <laughs> to true. <laughs> uh, so uh, what if we took an application which doesn't support uh, this uh, user uh, authorization and we added this to this application <laughs> and set it to true? Uh, 
Well, <laughs> in this way, our patched application would tell the terminal that it supports it, and we could tell the terminal that uh, uh, the uh, user is verified, so the terminal will not ask for the pin for the transactions over this uh, floor limit. So uh, this is where my results, uh, my research goes to the edge. <laughs> I mean, uh, at this specific uh, uh, attack scenario, uh, what I succeeded, I think, is that the terminal did not ask for the pin. In unpatched application, it did ask. So uh, this is the success part, uh, but the failure part is that the transaction was declined Maybe because the card was faked <laughs> in this case. <laughs> I couldn't do it on real cards. Uh, and it's not really easy to repeat this attack because most of these applications have uh, really good integrity protections. So it's not really easy to pass them. Uh, but when I asked the card processing guys uh, in this specific bank, they told me that they are not aware of any security <laughs> measure that could stop me from doing this. <laughs> Maybe they didn't know of something. Maybe this specific card, uh, for example, was set up to uh, require online PIN. Uh, I don't know, but probably uh, if I were a bank, I would <laughs> like to know how uh, my uh, system uh, would uh, react to such kind of attack. And it's definitely worth digging deeper. <laughs> Um, so, of course, besides Android Pay, uh, we tested multiple other applications and uh, most banks uh, are thinking of implementing it, uh, if, if not already implemented. Uh, we have made a living briefing proof of concept for eight applications which use seven different libraries. Uh, and others one we can estimate based on the libraries they use. It's not really easy to test it because in order to test it, you need a real bank account and a card. And it's not really easy to get uh, account number, for example, in Australia <laughs> when I live in Europe. <laughs> and so uh, it's uh, still... Uh <laughs> uh, uh, something to explore further, but we were able to clone all the tested uh, applications and I think it is possible to do it uh, for every <laughs> every possible instance. Uh, so um, a short uh, summary, well, uh, without going into too much of the details, uh, the easiest application uh, didn't even have the root detection and uh, really simple device checks, which even didn't require expose. Uh, and the replenish push didn't go through GCM, so it was a really fast target for the predator. <laughs> and uh, another one uh, did check very uh, a lot of device characteristics and had a really good root detection. So in order to uh, spoof the original device, I needed to use expose, but uh, I couldn't use it because of the root detection. And uh, uh, finally, I had to use exactly the same uh, phone, which was not rooted, but uh, the data just copied, and I cloned the INEI number, uh, and it worked. Um, okay, so what can we do better to prevent this? Well, the obvious question would be, can we prevent the cloning? Well, unfortunately, we cannot prevent it uh, uh, at this time, uh, but we can make it more difficult to, uh, to exploit. Uh, we can uh, use multiple uh, countermeasures which would divert the attackers to the other target. Uh, in the simple words, just don't be the last one. <laughs> so uh, we can use, uh, we can check for more device characteristics which are more difficult to spoof, for example. Uh, we can improve the root detections. Well, uh, safety net is possible to uh, bypass, but they have they are constantly improving and they have ways to do it much better, to integrate deeper into the OS. Uh, there is a nice open source one, which I found uh, difficult to bypass. 
Uh, and, uh, well, of course, integrity protections uh, that uh, we wouldn't be able to pass the applications. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, I think the most important, the, the backend fraud management. Well, at this moment, uh, they, in most cases, they uh, detect, uh, for example, the duplicated card use. So this is the sim single use card, uh, single use key. So when I uh, use it twice, they lock the card. But <laughs> as an attacker, I can uh, make transactions before the original user, or I can lock the original user. So uh, this duplicated card use will not appear. So I would suggest rather some kind of device scoring based, for example, what uh, version of Android are you using and how <laughs> is it probable that you are infected? <laughs> uh, there are malware handling solutions that are far from perfect and possible to bypass also, uh, but uh, you got to think of something, <laughs> to start with something. Uh, well, in the future, of course, uh, the devices will be more resi resilient. And I'm perfectly sure that Google is aware of its position, uh, that with its great power comes great responsibility, and they work really hard to make the devices more secure. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, the more widespread these mobile payments will be, the more they will get more attention from the fraudsters. Uh, so, uh, well, let's hope for the best, but uh, I would suggest to prepare and verify for the worst. And uh, with this uh, optimistic accent, <laughs> uh, I just like to invite you for another talk at AppSec uh, EU, where I will be giving uh, also a smart lock picking training. And I hope to see you tomorrow uh, for blue picking, hacking Bluetooth smart locks. We have seven different smart locks and a lot of fun. <laughs> so uh, I don't want to be <laughs> stand between you and the lunch. <laughs> so you are free to go. And if you have any questions, uh, I will be happy to answer. Give a warm, wel warm applause to Slavic. Yeah, we, if we have time, yeah, I sure. Just serve, but it isn't open yet. So any questions? Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, do you have any estimate what percentage of apps in the wild are vulnerable to your attack? And what is your estimate of the attacker effort in t terms of time for this particular attack? Uh, well, uh, as I said, we uh, practically tested uh, uh, pro pra practically proved on the uh, on eight application the practical cloning, uh, which uh, is just a simple trick that doesn't need to. Uh, I don't need to decode the encryption. I just spoof the device and it works out of the box, and uh, it should, in my opinion, work on all the applications uh, based, uh, like I told uh, previously, on the libraries they use. Uh, because uh, the same library works the same way. And all the applications uh, that have uh, this business requirement that uh, it needs to work without user interaction, so user doesn't enter any pin or whatever, and it also works offline, so you can't support the key from online something. So it makes this trick possible, in my opinion, on all, all the implementations. Uh, well, you might be able to find better device uh, characteristics, but I'm not aware of it. Uh, so the effort uh, depends, uh, the effort to attack depends on, on the uh, specific application uh, security uh, countermeasures, like integrity protection, root detection, and what kind of device characteristic it checks. So if the root detection is really good, it's in native library and it's difficult to bypass. And at the same time, the uh, mobile application checks for multiple device characteristics that I can't, for example, uh, just swap them in build.prop uh, and I need to use expose to uh, spoof them. Uh, and then 
uh, exposed in its root, but I can't hide this root, <laughs> then this effort would be uh, much bigger uh, because I would need to somehow fight with this, <laughs> some somehow bypass this uh, countermeasures or take exactly the same form with the same IMEI number and then uh, clone it. Uh, I hope it <laughs> answers your question. <laughs> okay. Thank you for your talk. And um, how different or similar is this to cloning uh, contactless credit cards or debit cards? Uh, it doesn't matter if it is a credit or debit card. It works the same, so if that was the question. Uh, yeah. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, when you talked about the countermeasures, did yeah. you also consider or do you see someone using the, the key store? Or the Keystore uh, API. Yeah, I especially saw the Keystore. Yes. Especially in the newer version, I think it's it's bound to the hardware modules, so you had better protection against cloning yes, and routing. Uh, well, uh, I saw one implementation that used the Keystore, and the Keystore was just a file, uh, in this case, uh, on my device. <laughs> so uh, I just simply copied the Keystore contents. Uh, I have root access, so I can also copy the Keystore file. Yeah, but the key score, uh, key store itself is encrypted with the device pin. Uh, yeah, well, I was able to. Uh, uh, okay, it's encrypted in the device pin, but uh, I assume that uh, as an attacker, I can also get the pin. Okay. Yeah. From the device. Yeah. Okay. Uh, of course, it. I hope uh, we will move more to TPMs or something. Uh, that we will be able to have a key store similar uh, uh, to the uh, iOS has, uh, and it will it would be a really nice uh, to have it in Android. But I know they are working on it, uh, and they I also told about it, on, uh, mentioned it uh, on my slide, and hopefully this will be one of the ways to improve this situation. Okay. Yeah. Thank That's you. A good question. Does the CD CVM uh, response include any sort of cryptographic verification or is it another yes card style attack where the device just says, yes, the correct pin was entered? Uh, I don't know uh, because uh, I am attacking it uh, on a higher level. <laughs> I mean, I, I just invoke the uh, API call in the HDE library and I don't care how it works uh, on the NFC layer. So uh, I assume that uh, the if if there is some kind of uh, crypto involved on the APDU packets on the NFC layer, the HCE library will take care of it for me. I just call it uh, the from the application layer the method from the uh, from the uh, API. So thanks for the call. My question was, is any of the devices where you were able to clone the uh, card emulation was using the hardware services or something like uh, an NS system? Uh, you mean uh, if the devices were using some hardware uh, TPM or something, right? Uh, uh, a secure, um, the secure world, if you like, that an, a custom-like implementation would offer so you could have the key store implemented there. Yeah, well, uh, I was uh, doing my proof of concept on a device that doesn't have this key store. Uh, like I previously mentioned, uh, one of the application used key store, uh, but because the device didn't have hardware support for key store, it stored the key store in the file that as a root, I could copy to another device. I, and if I set the same pin on another device, I can recruit it. Thanks for the talk. Uh, you've mentioned that in order for the contactless pay payment process to work, the screen on some devices needs to be on, right? Yeah, uh, well, uh, the screen on all the devices needs to be on. This is actually the requirement of HCE API in Android. Yeah. 
Okay. But you can have additional, uh, you can enforce additionally that the screen is unlocked, not just on. Okay. And that depends uh, on the mobile application. So Ma the Android API mm -hmm. uh, gives you uh, two ways to do it. One way is to uh, the screen needs to be on, and it needs to be on physically because uh, the NFC antenna is not wired up in other ways. Uh -huh. And the mobile application can additionally enforce that the screen is also unlocked. unlocked. Okay, in but the most of them do not. In the case where just the screen, the where the screen just needs to be on, yeah, uh, does it work during, for instance, an incoming call or an incoming SMS message? Uh, Let's say you send like a class zero, class five message to the device, so it's silent, but yeah. still you manage to turn the screen on. And at that point, with a physical attack, you can just yeah, it's a, it's a really nice <laughs> idea, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, did you sh did you try uh, any of that to see how the device behaves during that condition? Uh, no, I didn't try. We can try it in a minute if you like. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I would just need to put the SIM card in. Oh yeah, well we can try on my one. I have five different HC cards in it. So. <laughs> what I suggest is because lunch is opening in a minute. Um, and again, if you have your T-shirts pre-ordered, please pick them up at lunch. Uh, whoever wants to follow this demo, please join or ask them any questions after. Uh, yeah, like to close the chat for now. One more, one more applause for uh, for Slavic uh, Jason. Thanks.